you very much, Eric. And uh, thank you to everyone from the Haven Center for uh, inviting me to give me a chance to share my work with you today. Uh, this is joint work with Karen Levy, who's an outstanding graduate student in our department. So this project is motivated in part by Wikipedia and in part by this website, uh, kittenwar.com. So if you go to this website, then you will not hear a single thing I say for the rest of the talk. So please don't do it. But were you to go to this website, uh, you will see a picture of two kittens. You can vote for which kitten you think is cuter, and then two more kittens will come up. And then you can vote again and again and again. And before you know it, you spent 20 minutes clicking on cute kittens. Um, so this is a great way to spend your time on the web. Um, but it also turns out that something more interesting and more serious is happening here. So if you click to see the winningest kittens, this is what you'll see. So I'd say they're, they're pretty cute, uh, in my scientific opinion. Uh, and if you click to see the losingest kittens, this is what you'll see. So quite different. Um, let's go back to the winningest kittens. So <clears throat> what you've seen is that this very simple voting mechanism that's actually quite enjoyable is able to detect a very real social signal. The other thing about this that's very interesting is that all of these kittens were uploaded by users. And so you can compare that with how social scientists normally go about trying to find, let's say, the cutest kitten in the world. So what we might do is look in the literature for previous papers or go to the library and find some pictures of kittens, then put them on a survey and ask people to rate them. And so through that, we can learn about the kittens that we know about, but there could be other much cuter kittens out there that are not in the literature in our library. So by having all this content uploaded by users, we're able to discover things that we didn't know ahead of time. And that can be very powerful. So in general, this Kitten War website represents, I think, a way of resolving a fundamental tension that we have in the way that we try to collect social data. So on the one hand, we have methods that are very good for quantification. So those are traditional closed surveys. It's very easy to aggregate lots of information in an efficient, uh, transparent way. Uh, but you have to write all the questions and all the answers ahead of time. And so that makes it very hard to learn something new from a survey. On the other hand, then, we have methods like interviews, focus groups, participant observation that are open to new information. So people can tell you stuff you didn't know ahead of time, but those are slow, expensive, and hard to quantify. And so what we're trying to develop is a new class of data collection that we call wiki surveys, which tries to combine the quantifiability that you get from a survey with the openness that you get from an interview. And so the wiki here is very much styled after Wikipedia. So just in the way that a Wikipedia page evolves over time based on user input, you can imagine a survey that evolves over time based on user input, and that will give you the quantification and the openness. Um, so before going on, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about the way that I see the history of survey research, um, although many in the room probably know this history better than me. Uh, it used to be that all surveys were done face to face. Uh, people would come to your house and knock on your door and ask you questions. And then in the 60s and 70s, telephones became widespread in many developed countries. And people said, hey, we can do surveys over the telephone. And other people said, oh, no, you can't do that. Not everyone has a telephone. And that was true. And people might answer differently over the telephone than in person. And that's also true. Um, and so there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of research went into resolving those kinds of issues. But eventually, because the telephone survey allowed us to do things uh, quicker and easier than face-to-face -face surveys, eventually we resolved those problems, or at least convinced ourselves that we resolved those problems. So now I think we're undergoing a second technological change with the web. So there's widespread diffusion of the web. People say, well, not everyone has the web. That's certainly true. Uh, people may answer differently on the web than they would over the telephone. That's also certainly true. Um, but I think eventually these problems are going to get resolved. Uh, how they're going to get resolved, we don't quite know yet. And this project is sort of part of figuring that out. 
Uh, so if you're a person who has sort of a, um, a die-hard survey person, you will think that many of these characteristics of wiki survey, like the measurement characteristics of wiki surveys are not nearly as well understood as the measurement characteristics of traditional surveys, and that is certainly a fair concern. But people have been working on traditional surveys for 50 years, and people have been working on wiki surveys for about a year. Um, so this is, this is a step in that direction. And then this is part of my larger research interest in how the internet is going to change the way that we do all kinds of social research. So tomorrow I'm going to talk some about um, how the internet can allow us to do crowdsourcing and citizen science projects that will expand uh, the number of collaborators that we have. So normally we do research in collaboration with other people, but usually there's a small number of people, two, five, ten maybe is the biggest. But what if we could involve thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in our research? What if we could like Wikipedia style our research? Uh, and so that's something I'll be talking about uh, tomorrow. And I'll come back to some of these themes about how this wiki survey uh, project illustrates some of what I think are the main themes in this sort of broader um, research area. Okay, so the Go going back to this though, so many of you may say that, well, I've already been in a web-based survey. I've, I've done something with SurveyMonkey, or I've used Qualtrics, and so what I would argue is that those are not really web-based surveys. Those are face-to-face -face surveys put onto the web. If you printed out a SurveyMonkey survey, handed it to someone, it would look just like a survey from 1950 generally. So it's like taking a, a radio soap opera and putting a TV camera in front of it and saying that you have a TV soap opera. But you don't. You have a radio soap opera on TV, and I would argue that we have face-to-face -face surveys on the web. So what would a truly web-native survey look like? Um, and if you think of a survey as a tool for information aggregation, then you can start to look for ideas about what a web-native survey would look like from other web-based information aggregation systems, of which Wikipedia is an exemplar. Um, so we've sketched out uh, some general principles that we think wiki surveys should satisfy. There'll be three general principles, the first of which is greedy. Um, so I'm guessing that greedy is usually not a word used in a positive way in a Haven Center talk. But uh, in this case, out, out. <laughs> in this case, greed is good. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so this is a cartoon of the amount of information that's contributed to Wikipedia by different contributors. So here the contributors are sorted by rank. So the x-axis is the rank, and the y-axis is the amount of information contributed. So the person that contributes the most information to Wikipedia contributes a lot. This person has spent many, 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 many hours. So there's a small group of people that contribute lots and lots of information. These are people who are working 80 hours a week on Wikipedia. And then there's a large number of people who contribute a small amount of information. And one of the things that's great about Wikipedia is that it can harvest all of this information. It can take as much as you're willing to give it. Now, contrast that with traditional social science methods, where we take only a fixed amount of information for each person. So for example, imagine if someone comes to you and says, I love your survey, I want to do it 100 times. You say, oh, sorry, you can't do that. So we're losing all this information in here from people who want to give us more information. Now imagine if someone comes to you and says, you know, your survey is kind of interesting. I'll give you one minute. Then you say, no, no, you can't do that either. And so we're losing all of this information in here as well. And so in the context of Wikipedia, if you allow 10 and only 10 edits per editor, you would lose about 95% of the edits. So there's enormous, enormous amounts of information in this that they call the fat head and the long tail. And if you look at web data, you see this pattern over and over and over again. Very skewed amount of information contributed. So with wiki surveys, we want to be able to collect all of this information. We want to be able to collect as much or as little as people will give us. That will introduce complexity in the analysis for sure, and I'll talk some about how we deal with that. Okay, so that's greedy. The next general principle is that these should be collaborative. And by that, <coughs> I mean that Participants should have a role in shaping the questions and the answers in the survey, instead of having them be written entirely by the researchers. 
So this is what allows you to actually learn new things. Finally, they should be adaptive. And by this, what I mean is you should focus participants' time on the thing that's actually most informative to you. So if we treated our participants' time as a valuable resource, which we normally don't, but if we did, we would, we would say, we want, the question that we want to ask you is the one that will maximize the amount of information that we can learn about the thing that we care about the most. And so you can see this idea with adaptive testing, for example. So if you want to estimate someone's math ability, if you write all the questions ahead of time, then a lot of the questions you're asking are either going to be too easy or too hard, and you're wasting a lot of time. So if you construct the test adaptively, you can estimate someone's ability much more quickly. And if you think about how we do it with regular surveys, we write the questionnaire. We, let's say we want to do 1,000 interviews. By the time we've done 500 interviews, we actually know a lot more than we knew at the beginning, but we don't change what we're doing in any way. Um, so one thing is that the difference between adaptive and collaborative is sometimes confusing. And so one way to think about it is collaborative is about being open to new information, and adaptive is about using the information you have more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> now, so these are the three general principles. And there was no tool available to actually do wiki survey. We wanted to actually do this, not just write an abstract paper. Um, so we built our own tool to do wiki surveys. So with funding from Google, we built this website, allourideas.org. It's uh, free to anyone. It's open source, completely open source. Uh, and anyone can come here and create their own wiki survey, which we host for them. So you can think of it as like, Survey Monkey for wiki surveys. Um, and so by creating this website and making it freely available, we get to provide this nice service for people who want to use the tool. And at the same time, we get a tremendous amount of data. So everything that's happening is all recorded on our servers. And we have a constant stream of participants where, that we can use to do sort of methodological research. Um, so this is the website, and then let me show you uh, an example of what it looks like and how it works in practice. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, a project that we did with Mayor Bloomberg's office in New York. So this was part of something called Plan YC 2030. It's um, the, the city's long-term sustainability plan. So they want a plan to make New York a greener and greater city. Um, Last year, they were updating the plan, and so Mayor Bloomberg went around the city asking people in hard hats what they thought he should do. Um, and he did other things as well. So they had meetings in libraries, they had um, community center events, uh, city council hearings, and so on. Um, but they realized that the people who come to those events are quite atypical of all New Yorkers, certainly not a representative selection. And also, it's very difficult to take what comes out of those hearings and aggregate it in a transparent and fair way. So imagine people have spent two hours arguing about New York. Um, and imagine they're New Yorkers arguing, so it's even more intense. So how do you, like, in a fair way, distill that into something that's clear and actionable in the same way that a survey gives you something that the aggregation process is transparent? And so in addition to the things that they had done in the past, they also tried a wiki survey. Um, so they picked a question. Uh, and I should say that these wiki surveys, as they are now, only allow for a single question. So regular surveys have many questions. Wiki surveys now only have one question. Um, so the question they had was, which do you think is a better idea for creating a greener and greater New York City? And then they seeded the wiki survey with 25 ideas that came from their previous outreach efforts. So you can see some examples, things like requiring energy upgrades, uh, increasing tree plantings, and so on. So voters who came to the website, uh, the wiki survey, this is what they saw. So they were presented with two ideas chosen from the pool of options, and they were asked to vote. Then they saw two new ideas, they voted again, and so on. So you can see this is basically kitten war for ideas. Um, also, at any time, anyone can view the results, so the process is completely transparent in real time. So if you think about how a normal survey works, 
the mayor's office would commission the survey, the data would go to the mayor's office, the mayor's office would write a report and present it to the public. That creates a possibility for a lot of editorial control, let's say. So I, I don't think the mayor's office in New York would do this, but there is a possibility that whoever gets to write the report has a lot of control over what gets presented. Here, everything is available in real time, and there's no reason that that's not possible now, um, given that the data is all digitally native. Um, okay, so I should also say, if anyone has any questions while this is going along, feel free to ask. Um, so I'm gonna. So here, the, these are the top ten ideas sorted by this thing called the score. And now I'm going to explain how we calculate that score. On the previous yeah. slide, sure. the add your own ID. Oh yes. Does that get paired automatically, or is it just you're adding it and then? It oh yeah. So here's so if you click on this add your own idea button, uh, a little box will open up and you can type in your own idea. Then that will get. Um, added to the system, the, ma the mayor's office or whoever created the wiki survey will get an email saying someone has uploaded the idea uh, ban meet in Manhattan. And do you want to activate this idea or not? And if you click on a link, then the idea becomes active and then it starts showing up in these pairs. So it is vetted by the organizers of the survey. By the wiki survey creator. To prevent a kind of vandalism problem. Yeah, there's there's definitely a vandalism. So with the New York City Mayor's Office, they had about 450 ideas uploaded, and they activated about 250 of them, which tells you something about New Yorkers. <laughs> yep? Can one change one's mind and move backward or step? No. Okay. Only forward. And how do you accommodate the greedy principle in here? I mean, can people vote more than once? Yeah, people can vote as many times as they want or as few times as they want. But you're voting over separate pairs. You're not voting for the same pair. No, no, no. The pairs change, and the pairs are picked randomly um, with one little variation, which is that ideas that are recently uploaded get shown with higher probability. So if you think, let's imagine this has been going for a few days. We know quite a bit already about the seed ideas. Someone uploads something new. A vote about the new idea is much more valuable to us for learning than a vote about something that we've already seen a lot of votes about. And so we take the new ideas and show them with higher probability. Now, more generally, what we'd like to do, which is what we don't do yet, is we'd like to be able to estimate a full statistical model in real time and then choose the pair that will tighten up the posterior distribution around the parameters that we care about most. So there's a formal way of sort of defining what's the most um, pair that's likely to give you the most information. Right now, we just use a heuristic approximation of showing ideas with fewer appearances with higher probability. Now, just one last thing. Yeah. If, if you um, were a real eager beaver mm -hmm. and, and just kept at this for 50 hours a, mm -hmm. a week, as it were, mm -hmm. with 25 seated, yeah. you'd be hitting the same things over. Yes. You'd even be hitting the same pairs over and over. Yes. So, so then you'd be, you could get into a situation where a person is actually voting in ways that's not giving you new information, but distorting information. So that is, their priorities are just getting to so do. Oh, yeah. Let me show you how we re account for the fact that some people contribute more than others. But usually, so even though there were 25 ideas to start with, Usually there are on the order of hundreds of ideas. It's pretty typical. And so the chance of seeing the same pair is very low. But this, this it, there is certainly the case that some people vote a lot more than others, and we have a way of trying to deal with that in the analysis. Yeah? I had the sort of question. One, some that maybe you know, don't have to do with the, the wiki principle of it, but as for the wiki principle of it, once new ideas are generated and added to the system, people have already voted and we're done voting, they don't get back. So supposedly there's a real skew in the characteristic of people who vote and, you know, I don't know, most of the people from a certain zone code mm -hmm. voted first or something, then you kind of like lose this type of feedback. What do you do about that? Yeah. So if there's temporal inhomogeneity, if, so for example, imagine that with the New York case, there's like no vegans that vote, then a bunch of vegans come, someone uploads the idea of ban meat in Manhattan, then a bunch of vegans vote. In the model that I'll show you, basically what we're doing is we're going to assume that the votes that we see give us information about the votes that we haven't seen. 
And so if there's no vegans and then there's a bunch of vegans, then that's one way that the model can be wrong. Now, I should also say that if there is that sort of inhomogeneity and alien preferences, that's something that should be detectable in the data. Now, we don't currently have a way of doing that, but if we see, because we record every single vote, we know exactly when each vote happens, and we also know the referring URLs, so where these people came from. So we can potentially detect that, although we don't do that yet. Isn't that a breach of privacy, though? I mean, why do you detect the URL people are coming from? That's done in every website. It's in the, that's how the server logs work. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, so let me talk now a little bit more about how we do the estimation to deal with some of the problems that people have, have raised. Um, so the data structure that we have is the following. We have a bunch of votes, and they're nested within sessions. So a session is roughly a visit to the website. So you can see that the first vote, the first one is comparing item four and item one, and they voted for item four. And this is the sort of sequence of votes, and their first session had three votes, the next session had two votes, and so on. And from that, what we want to do is we want to estimate this matrix here, which I'm calling public opinion. And so roughly what this is, is each row is a session. You can think of this roughly as a person. And each column is an idea. And so what we'd like to know is what each person thought of each idea. And if we knew that, then we would know that's a lot of stuff we would know. Um, the problem is that we have very incomplete data. So most people don't vote on most of the ideas. Also, we don't know how much anyone likes any particular idea because they don't tell us. All they give us is this relative information. Um, and for some rows in this matrix, we have lots of information. And for other rows, we have a little bit. So for example, if you have someone who votes for 80 hours, we can estimate their row in this matrix quite well. But for someone who only votes twice or once, then what we're, we have very little information. And so you'll see that we use a kind of like hierarchical modeling to sort of pool information. So if you don't vote, if let's say person two never votes on idea two, we try to estimate what, how much person two will like idea two based on the things, based on how much other people have liked idea two. And then I'll talk more about how we could generalize that. There's, there are ways to do that even better than we're doing now. But the intuition is we, we want to estimate this full matrix. We have some information, and then we try to like average across respondents to estimate the rest of the information. Um, so that now I'm going to go through. So the approach to do this that we're going to use is we're going to come up with a data generating model, and then we're going to find the parameters that are most consistent with that data generating model using Bayesian inference. So I'm going to. Yeah. Uh, next describes the assumptions that go into the data generating model. <clears throat> so we have to make an assumption about how people vote. And so we say that the probability that uh, item A beats item B in session J is a function of the difference between the amount that the person likes the two items. So if one item is free bike racks and the other item is banned meat, we say that the amount, the probability of you voting for free bike racks is a function of the difference between how much you like the items and then map to a cumulative standard normal. So we take the difference in how much you like the items, which can range from minus infinity to infinity, and we map that to a probability that goes from zero to one. So this is very much like a probit model. Um, you could also do this, so if you use the uh, cumulative standard normal, the probit kind of thing, this turns out to be equivalent to something called a thurstone Mosteller model, which people have studied a lot in the discrete choice literature. Um, if you use a logit, which looks very similar to this, that becomes equivalent to something called the Bradley-Terry model. Um, so this is a pretty standard assumption to make. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to assume some things about the structure of public opinion in the population. So we're going to assume that <coughs> the amount of people like idea one is normally distributed with a mean that's specific to idea one and a certain uh, standard deviation. 
So for example, if idea one is free bike racks in New York, the, we're going to assume that the amount that people like that is normally distributed for, with a given mean that's specific to free bike racks. Next, we're going to assume that the amount, the amount people like idea two is normally distributed with a different mean, but the same standard deviation. And we're going to make that assumption for all the ideas. So one question you might have is, why do you assume the same standard deviation? And the answer is, we try to estimate this standard deviation from the data, so you could get a measure of sort of polarization for each idea, the amount of variability there is in support. Um, but for the cases we have, the amount of data we have, given the modeling framework now, we can't, there's not enough information to do that. So estimating these variance parameters in hierarchical models is kind of tricky. Um, so for now, this is sort of a simplifying assumption to make everything work. Uh, with better modeling, you should be able to estimate this from the data as well. Okay, so if you put all that together, then you get this posterior distribution. Um, so we don't need to go into this in great detail, but I want to just point out the components in this posterior distribution. So this is the term that comes from the votes. This is the term that comes from the hierarchical components, the averaging across people. And then this is the prior on the mean parameters. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to try to take repeated draws from this posterior distribution using MCMC to summarize it. And so we do that with Gibbs sampling. Um, however, one problem that you'll run in, it, doing Gibbs sampling on this turns out to be a little bit hard. Uh, and so there's two computational tricks that you have to do that are described in detail in Appendix B of the paper that took forever, but no one else seems to care about them. But I care about them, <laughs> they took forever. Uh, so it just, I have to at least say what they are. Um, so one of them it is pretty standard if you know about data augmentation. So there's a, um, the Albert and Chip data augmentation. The second one is one that I haven't seen before, um, which involves, but I'm sure people have done this, but it involves separating out the parameters to be ones that are determined by the votes and the hyperparameters and ones that are only determined by the hyperparameters. And it turns out that that allows you to simplify the design matrix quite a bit and makes everything much easier. So anyway, appendix B of the paper, sorry. Um, okay, so then you get uh, estimated public opinion matrix. So in the New York City case, this matrix has about half a million entries. So we have, so we're, esti we're estimating a huge number of parameters here. And that comes from doing this hierarchical modeling. Uh, so we have about uh, 2,000 sessions and 25, uh, 250 ideas. So we can't then take this matrix and give it to Mayor Bloomberg. Say, here's half a million numbers measured on a scale that you don't <coughs> understand and no one really understands. Uh, so instead what we do is we summarize this matrix with a vector. Yep. Um, you said 250 sessions. That means you basically have 200, 250 more or less individuals, maybe less that respond. I'm sorry, 2,000 sessions, 250 ideas. Um, so what we do is we take this very big matrix and we summarize it with this vector, which gives what we call the score for each idea. And the score is the probability that item, the score for the idea like free bike racks in Manhattan is the probability that this idea will be a randomly chosen other idea for a randomly chosen session. So all the ideas are compared against all the other ideas. And so that gives an interpretable measure, uh, which ranges from zero for an idea that's expected to lose every contest to 100 for an idea that's expected to win every contest. So one nice feature about this is that it's human interpretable. Uh, it's also can be checked. So this is a clear prediction that we're making that you could check with a different method, uh, like doing a regular survey. You could pair. Our site makes certain predictions about what would happen if you did that, and you could test those with a different method. Also, by presenting the scores, we're agnostic to how these uh, data are estimated. So we can develop more and more sophisticated models and then always map them back to this same metric. So it's a flex, it gives us flexibility because, so for example, you might think, well, we should present the hierarchical means. 
But then if we change the model and it doesn't have hierarchical means anymore, we can't do that. So this is a, a way of presenting the results that's, you could drop many different models in the back. Okay, so that's the score. Okay, so now that you understand the sort of how we take the data and what we uh, use it to estimate, let's go back to the New York City example and see what actually happened. Um, so as we know, this was the question. These were the seed ideas. So they recruited participants through Twitter, Facebook, blogs, etc. So this is a tweet that went out from the mayor's office. So I want to be very clear that this is not a random sample. Um, this is basically, oh, who knows what it is. Uh, so we can only make estimates about the people who have visited the website. <coughs> However, I want to say there's absolutely nothing that prevents this from being done with a random sample of people. So the mayor's office did not uh, have resources to do that, but there's nothing that prevents that in any way whatsoever. So although what I'm going to show you today is not uh, a random sample, all the modeling carries through to the case where you have random samples. Uh, and even complex sample designs can be accommodated in the model. Assuming the sampling design is known, which in this case it's not. Um, so what happened, so they had about 28,000 votes cast and 464 ideas uploaded. So what this graph, these two graphs show is the sort of distribution of effort. So you remember we had that cartoon from Wikipedia? So here's the person who contributed the most information to this wiki survey, and they cast more than 600 votes. And you see basically exactly the pattern that you would expect from looking at other web data. And so this is for the votes, and this is for the uh, ideas uploaded. So someone uploaded 50 ideas. Uh, a number of people uploaded more than one idea, and many people just uploaded one idea. So this is exactly the pattern that you would have expected. And let's see what they found. So here I plotted the top 10 ideas as estimated by the model. So the, the x-axis here is the score, which I talked about as the expected uh, probability of beating a randomly chosen idea. And um, so these are the top 10 ideas. And the ideas that are in blue were uploaded by users. So what you see is that eight of the top 10 ideas were uploaded by users or not things that were on the mayor's initial top 25 list. <laughs> and so this, I think, shows the value of wiki surveys because these are all things that they would not have learned about otherwise. Now, so th when we saw this, we were very excited. We were like, hey, that's cool. Uh, we learned some new things. Um, but then we wanted to find out what were these new things? Like, why was it that the mayor's office didn't include these on the surveys to begin with? What kinds of new things were we learning about? So we did interviews with eight <coughs> different uh, wiki survey creators, and through that we noticed some commonalities in the kinds of things that got uploaded and scored well. And so now I'm going to tell you about what those are. And those are actually both nicely illustrated by this New York example. So uh, here's the number one idea as voted on by participants. Uh, keep New York City's drinking water clean by banning fracking in New York's watershed. So fracking is a technique for extracting uh, natural gas, which, um, let's see, some people think is very dangerous, and people in the oil and gas industry think is very safe. Uh, I'm not a geologist, so I don't know, but I do know as a sociologist that people who voted in this survey really were concerned about this idea. Um, so we did interviews with the person in the mayor's office. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if, if uh, multiple people upload roughly the same idea, like mm -hmm. someone, someone writes it like that, someone else writes just ban fracking, yep. does the office then like compile those into one that they, that they activate? Uh, well, let me, let me sh uh, tell you what the mayor's office said here, and then I'll answer that question. But that's, that's an important point. Um, so <laughs> Ibrahim from the mayor's office said, we hate fracking, and we've been very clear about it. And so this for us, this says, we have support amongst people who are paying attention to be very clear that we don't like fracking. To which Karen said, OK, 
So why was fracking not one of the seed ideas that you guys had? To which Ibrahim says, because we talk about it differently. We'll say protect the watershed. We don't say protect the watershed from fracking. And so one of the patterns that we see over and over again is that ideas that are uploaded by users are framed differently than ideas from people within the organization. So people within organizations tend to speak in organization talk, let's say. And users tend to speak in user talk. And user talk tends to resonate much more with other users than organization talk. So the issue about duplicates um, is one that comes up a lot. And what I would say is that it's not for the wiki survey creator to decide what is a duplicate and what is not a duplicate. That that decision can be left to the user. So I always suggest to people that they activate all the ideas and then the users will decide. So if it turns out that someone else uploaded something else about protecting the water and they score the same, then you can get a sense that the users think these two ideas are basically the same. But if you see that they score differently, then you've learned something. So normally we think of sort of um, question wording effects as being like dangerous. Um, and that's true to some extent, but it's also interesting, right? If you see that by putting the word frack uh, fracking in the idea, that changes the amount that people care about it, that's interesting and important. Um, and so you may also you know, worry about other kinds of standardization things here. But one of the features of this is that if someone uploads this idea, let's say, and you're worried about exactly how it's framed, uh, you can upload an equivalent idea with slightly different framing. So let's say you're worried about the word drinking here. Like you want to know about water in general, not just drinking water. So you can upload that idea too. And then both of them will be running in the system and you can see if there's a wording effect or not. So we're used to being in a world where we have very limited space on surveys. And that's not the case here. So we can handle very large numbers of ideas because not every person votes on every idea. So you know, in the New York City example, we had 250 ideas that were in circulation. So adding another idea to that, or another several variations of the same thing, it's not really a problem. Did, did they have the Protect the Watershed on it as one of theirs? So that's a, a so, we, they said it's yeah. a <laughs> so we checked that. And no, they did not have anything about the water uh, in their initial set of ideas. And um, we're not really sure why that is. Uh, so this is something I've learned about interviews. Uh, <laughs> which is that people say all kinds of things. But I, I, I do think it is the case, um, I do think it is the case that if you ask them, do you care about protecting the watershed, they would say yes. Um, and I just think that when they were coming up with their list of seed ideas, the watershed was not one of the first things that popped into their head. Um, but maybe if, if they had even thought about fracking, then the watershed would have popped into their head. But I think this generally goes to the point that like, there are just a lot of things that you don't know about ahead of time. And it's very hard to even know all the things that you don't know. Uh, and this helps you, this help protects you from missing things that even you knew ahead of time, but you just sort of forgot. Yeah? So, so I, I, you already said this, but, I, but now I'm wondering. So if I'm a participant, can I pass this on via Twitter to somebody else, or is it just what the mayor so what? So then, the sampling bias of a lot of environmentalists passing this on could affect this, right? Sure. So what distinguishes this? From, I was thinking like the Ed Schultz MSNBC like vote, you know, where like ninety percent of the people vote because they're listening to him. Sure. So I mean, I understand that there's more information, but what rises to the top is like who's. Sure. Right. So, what, so what I would say is we've measured the preferences of people who visited this website. If we had someone who wanted to pay to do a random sample, then we could do everything. This could do, be exactly the same. So this is sort of meant to be a case study. Um, and the sampling is a big issue, for sure. Uh, but I would also argue that you know, if you do a telephone survey and you have 20% response rate, let's say, yeah. You have other, I mean, so sampling is definitely a problem. Sampling is a problem for all kinds of data collection. Um, yeah? 
Do people, do, do ideas that were added earlier on have an advantage over newer ideas because of high yeah. frequency of voting and something? Uh, no, so one of the things that uh, I was very worried about because of some of my earlier research is that you want to avoid kind of popularity snowballs, right? So one of the things that you'll notice is people have no information about the popularity of the ideas when they vote. So people have to vote independently and that prevents a lot of these snowballs. You'll also notice that no one has any idea who's actually uploaded these ideas. So this contrasts a lot with, sort of, for example, meeting, face-to-face -face meetings. So for example, this idea could have been uploaded by the mayor's chief of staff and this could have been uploaded by a 13-year-old kid in the Bronx. They're treated exactly the same. But they would have an idea of the popularity on their second vote. Right, now, so, so you'll notice that the voting and the viewing the results are decoupled, mm -hmm. and you're not able to vote from this page. Okay. So you can't come here and say, oh, I, I want to ban fracking, I want to vote for that. That's not possible. So if, after you view the results, if you go back to the voting, you have to keep voting until that idea comes up. So this is something that makes this much more manipulation resistant than many other online information aggregation systems, which is mainly that you don't choose what you vote on, we choose what you vote on. So that allows us to do, do things more adaptively because we can focus your attention on what's most important and we can prevent certain kinds of manipulation because you have to cast many votes before you can find the idea that you're looking for. Yeah. Matthew, what would, a, what would a random sample, I mean, if you don't want to get into this, you want to yep. postpone, that's fine. What would a random sample look like? What would a random seeding look like in this case? And wouldn't each seed essentially be the beginning of a set of potential snowballs? Which I don't think is bad necessarily, but how would that affect the random, initial randomization? Sure, so in this case, if you wanted to do, let's say there was an um, online panel, so there are many companies that have online panels. How they claim to get a random sample in their panel is a separate issue, but presumably, let's pretend that they do really have that. Then you can email those people, ask them to participate, and then have them participate. And so you, then you have the attitude of those people. It is one thing that's weird about this, it's different than a regular survey, is that it is kind of hard to think about what a replication of this might be. Because let's imagine that you did this in New York and then you do it again next year in New York. So if you have a fixed instrument, you have a comparable thing. If you do this next year, different ideas will be uploaded and so in some sense, you're measuring something different. You're measuring, you're only measuring how much this idea compares to the other ideas that are currently in the system. So in some ways that's good because it, it gives you sort of a flexible way of measuring preferences, but in some ways it's bad because it, it's flexible, right? And flexibility is given bad in this case. Yeah? So, um, so, so I, I, I get that if you just view this as a new kind of instrument, and you do random sampling, then you're fine. You don't, you don't have this kind of selection Bias and who gets to contribute at all. But I don't have intuition for, and I was wondering if you could help me with that, is how you avoid the selectivity. In, so it's a disproportional influence coming from the selectivity of those who like to stay on the site for 80 hours. Yeah, okay, so. so like if, you, if you did only with, like, if you only had row uh, specific estimates. <laughs> Then that be okay. You wouldn't worry if somebody just you know, spent eight hours or two minutes on it. But you have a between component. I think that that's the column, right? Mm -hmm. So if the people that you know somehow happen to have eight hours of their time to work on this are systematically different from those that say, oh, you know, nonsense, just two yeah. minutes of my yeah. precious time, and then I go back to watch TV. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, this is an issue for sure. So basically, the, the model the way it is now, what we do is, let's say this person, let's imagine that there are two, to simplify this, let's imagine there are two kinds of people, they're vegans and non-vegans, and let's imagine that vegans vote a lot and non-vegans don't vote a lot. Okay, now let's say person two did not vote on idea two, what we then do is basically use the other estimates we have for idea two 
to estimate this person's preferences. And if there are vegans and non-vegans, and if the vegans vote a lot and the non-vegans don't, then basically the data that we have is much more likely to be from a vegan than a non-vegan, and so we're going to potentially get a biased estimate here if this person is not a vegan. So that's absolutely an issue. Um, one way to deal with that is if we have covariates. So if we have covariates about the people, and if we have covariates about the ideas, we can potentially remove some of those problems. But it's still potentially an issue. Now, one other thing is that, so this doesn't completely resolve that problem. Uh, it does minimize it to some extent, because if someone votes, let's say, a billion times, they still only count as one row, and so they still only get treated the same in the averaging process. So we average over people instead of averaging over votes, in some sense. Right, so that's um, part of the issue. I should so, also. So, sorry, so, so this problem, this problem should increase with the number of items that you feed into your pair comparison. Right? Yes, because so the more items you have, the sparser this is. The sparser this is, the more averaging you're doing, the more pooling you're doing. Now, again, we could be doing the pooling much better than we're doing it now. So we could have covariance. Um, we could also use the correlation structure that's in the data. So for example, people who vote for bike racks, let's say we notice that people who vote for free bike racks also vote for free bike helmets. So we could take advantage of that if someone has voted, we don't know what they voted on, but they voted on a similar idea that seems to be correlated. So there's many ways to improve this model. Um, but I think the general framework of thinking about this is everything we want to estimate, and then we some of it is based on the votes, and some of it is based on some kind of model, um, is a flexible way of handling it. This structure also naturally allows, as I said, for different amounts of information per person. And I should also say, in addition to the score, uh, we can also estimate lots of other things from this as well. So we can see people who like these ideas also tend to like these ideas, and so on. So you may wonder, like, why estimate all of this if you're just going to present the scores? Why not estimate the scores directly? Which is, you know, any time you see someone estimating something and then summarizing it in a different way, you should wonder why they're not just estimating the other thing. But the reason is because this, what we talked about, this different amounts of information that you want to, and potentially you want to add covariates, and then potentially you uh, want to estimate other things about public opinion. Okay, so we talked about this one idea, um, which represents a broader class of things, that is, things that are uploaded by users tend to be framed differently than things that are the initial seed ideas. The next idea I want to talk about is this one. Uh, plug ships into electricity grids so they don't idle in port, reducing emissions equivalent to 12,000 cars per ship. So this idea was uploaded by someone in New York, we don't know who. Uh, and it scored very well. And here's what the mayor's office had to say about it. So this relates to two areas. So plugging ships into the electricity grid, so that's one in terms of energy and sourcing of energy, and it relates to freight. To which Karen says, okay, which are two separate silos. So I should say also previous to this, they had been talking about how the mayor's office is broken up into distinct sort of policy areas. And this is an idea that happens to be sort of in between two different areas and so sort of lacks a clear home to it. So anyway, so these are two different silos, and Ibrahim says, correct. Freight is something we're looking closer at, and emissions, reducing emissions is something that's an overall goal of the plan. We want to reduce carbon emissions 30% by 2030. So this has a lot of value for us to learn from. Um, so when we first saw this, we actually were, we wondered if this was actually true. I mean, <laughs> this is the, so at the beginning, when I started this process, I used to think that these wiki surveys help you find the best ideas. And now what I would say is these help you find the ideas that people think are the best ideas. Uh, but in this case, it turns out this is actually true. Uh, and now this is actually in the city's plan. Um, so they definitely learned something that they ended up using. Um, yeah? Like, so as, if I imagine myself to be a respondent, my issue is, I don't even know what this means. Like, it reduces emissions relative to 12,000 cars per ship. Mm -hmm. 
does that mean we're using up less metal? Oh, no, so, yeah, yeah, so. so five minutes, so, like, you see the point, right? So, like, yep. on, a, on a regular survey, this would get shocked because it's, you know, it's not clearly formulated. Sure. And, well, and yeah. so that, that, so do you have, I don't remember, on your, on your, on your, on your kitten interface, yep. do you also have, I can't decide between these two Yes, movies? yes, so we have, um, I can't decide, oh. and if you hit this, actually a sequence of, a series of choices comes up, so I don't know enough about the left idea, I don't know enough about the right idea, I, I like both ideas, I don't like either idea, so another thing we want to do is use that data more carefully in the modeling, because that's actually quite valuable data. We don't right now. So basically, all we use is the boats, the skips are not included in the model, even though there's in interesting information there. Another source of interesting information that we're not using is when you add your own idea, we also see what you vote on. So that can, we can estimate, we should get pretty strong correlations from that. Not, none of that is in the model. There's really, it's a, really kind of rich, complicated data structure, and we're really only using quite simple parts of it now. Um, yeah, so this is another example where, you know, this, the question wording is potentially an issue. If you remove this 12,000 cars per ship, perhaps it would not have scored as well. Um, we'll never know, but when this was uploaded, they could have tried to do that experiment to see. Um, but anyway, this bubbled up, they investigated, turns out to be uh, what they thought was a good idea, so it's in the plan. Um, so this is the sort of second class of things that seem to bubble up is actually new information. So there's reframing of existing information and there's actually new information. Now, one of the things that we saw, so as I said, the, many of the top ideas were uploaded by users, and we were very excited about that. And then we've seen this over and over and over again, that many of the top ideas are uploaded by users. And so then we started thinking that maybe there's something more systematic here. And so in the next slide, I'm going to try to convince you that this will always happen. That pretty much every time you do this, the best ideas will be uploaded by users, and it's just a sort of mathematical regularity that has to happen. Um, and here's why. So this is from the New York data. So these are the seed ideas, the top, these are the 25 seed ideas. The y-axis here is the score. And these are the uploaded ideas. Now one of the things that you might think is the uploaded ideas will be bad, right? Because who are these people? People are just to upload junk. And that is true. Most of the uploaded ideas are really bad. And the worst ideas are uploaded by users. But there's a ton of uploaded ideas. There's a lot. And they have very high variance. So if you take high variance and lots of volume, you get extreme cases. Right? In this case, all we care about is the best ideas. And so opening yourself up to a high variance source of information with high volume, that's where the ideas are going to be. And so it seems like basically this sort of has to happen because of this pattern. Unless the uploaded ideas are so bad, the mean is so low that the variance is not enough. But if the variance is even close, I mean, if the mean is even close to the mean of the seed ideas, then that variance will help you find these extreme cases in the tails. Yeah? It doesn't seem to me that it's a, it's a mathematical truth that, mm -hmm. that the best ideas among the seed ideas won't be better than the best ideas among that are uploaded. It may be true that you're going to have in the top 25 a disproportionate number of seed ideas, but that that the experts thinking about what the, most, the best, since they have called, you're calling them seeds, but they've been talking to people for years about sure, it. Sure, so sure. It's, it, the fact that the, on that there's five or six that are better than any, yeah. or maybe more than any of the seed. I don't think that's a, a mathematical truth. It's not, well, so, what I, I mean, I've looked at a lot of these pictures, and they all look like this. Right, but and, then, and so you can make a model where you say, if you assume that the means of the uploaded ideas and the seed ideas follow a certain distribution, so if you put those, variance, if you put those, if you put those top four dots yeah, that are way yeah. above as the seed for the next one. Sure. 
there'd be no reason to expect that they're going to drop from 80 to 60. That's correct. So they would still, they would be at the top of the next one. So, you know. Yeah, yeah okay. So for, if you create a new seed on the basis of this data, it was, it's unlikely that there would be five that would be better than any of those. I would say if you did this a year later, it would be highly likely that there would be something else by then. But you're, if it's a purely mathematical thing, it would happen even if you did it a day later. Correct. So, <laughs> okay, so I think it's an empirical regularity driven by the patterns that we see in the mean and variance of the seed ideas and the uploaded ideas. It's not, uh, it doesn't have to happen, there's nothing that requires that to happen, but it seems to happen very frequently and I think that's why. Yeah. And you're talking about within the New York City example, right? Yes, this is all New York City data, but if you look at this from other, so in the paper we have this same graph from a project that we did with the OECD and it looks basically exactly the same. Okay, so in the two years, so that's just one wiki survey, and in the two years since we've launched, we've had about 1,500 wiki surveys have been created. Uh, we have about 60,000 ideas and 2.5 million votes. So this is the map of where the votes are coming from, basically from all over the world. Um, we've had a number of other groups uh, use a site. Uh, in my talk on Thursday, I'll talk more about some of these examples and talk more about some of the practical issues in terms of how you actually do wiki surveys in practice. Um, so there are a number of research goals uh, going forward. One is to develop uh, better algorithmic and statistical methods to squeeze as much information as possible from each vote. So as I said, we want to focus people's attention on what will give us the most information. Um, or we can potentially think about lots of other improvements, adding the correlation structure, adding covariance, and so on. One nice thing about this is that, um, so it's, it's often the case that you can make statistical models more and more complicated. Here we actually have a way of quantifying how much better we're getting by seeing how well we can predict held out votes. So we can hold out some data and see how well we can predict the data that we haven't seen yet, and we can use that to quantify how much adding complexity to the model actually helps us. Um, also, we want to develop and test methods to encourage voting and uploading. So these things only work if people actually contribute information. And so a big problem is how do you get people to contribute more and more information? So for example, we're doing now some A-B tests on the website where half the people see the button that says add your own idea, actually a third see add your own idea, a third C, help your community, add your own idea, and a third C, make your voice heard, have your, uh, add your own idea. So sort of neutral community and self-orientation. Uh, turns out it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Uh, but more generally, we can have different algorithms for choosing the pairs. Because, so one thing is that every single person who's ever used this has stopped using it. Every single person. And so we also have data on the pairs that cause people to leave. So we could, for example, show those pairs with lower frequency. There's lots of things we could do to try to maximize the amount of information that people contribute. Um, what exactly do you mean by every user has stopped using it? Do you expect them to still be No, no, no. Them? Everyone stops, though. I mean, that's just, so every single user has a final pair. Yeah. So, well, so then that suggests that those pairs are the ones that people don't like. So one of the things we've seen, I've done a very sort of quick and dirty analysis of this, and it seems to be the case uh, that if people are more likely to leave when they're given two low scoring options. So people don't, see, you might think people don't like to make hard decisions. So, like, so you might think, all right, what kinds of things would people not, what kinds of choices would people not like to make? So you might think, People would like to make a choice between an easy, a good, really good thing and a bad thing, because that's easy. Um, but they might not like to make a choice between two good things or two bad things, because those are harder cognitively. So it turns out, in this very rough cut of the data, um, that people don't mind choosing between two good things, but people seem to not like choosing between two bad things, because then they have to vote for something that they don't actually like, and people don't seem to like that. 
according to your transparency yeah. model, they already see that these are low ranking. They already know that their votes kind of would count less because there is enough information that these are low ranking ideas. Oh, but they don't know how popular the ideas are when they vote on them. So the, you would you would have to view the results, then you'd have to scan through the entire list of results and go back to the voting to see how popular they are. Yeah? So first of all, you could do that in the second tab, right? Or a second window. You could do that. Right. And then, um, is it every person that has a final uh, pair or every session? Every session, okay, correct. Um, so one other thing is that if you do have some kind of random sampling, if you have some kind of authentication system, then you don't need to go through this thing about the difference between a person and a session. We do not have that now, so we can only make statements about sessions. The reason why we don't have all that authentication stuff is because we did not want to create barriers to entry for people to participate. So one of the things that I've seen in a lot of these other online systems is the more barriers you have to go through to participate, the more it's just crazy people. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, again, it's a very technical term. Uh, so, but basically, what we wanted to do is make it as easy as possible for as many people as possible to participate. Yep. How exact is geolocation based on that? Uh, it's pretty well. So there's two things. So, like, how accurate is it for Google, and how accurate is it for what we're so we're doing a we're using an open source database. So they claim it's 98 percent accurate to the country. Uh, and then like 90% accurate to the state, but it also varies by country. So within the U.S., it seems to be pretty good. In other countries, it seems to make mistakes some. We're not talking about black group. No, 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 definitely not, definitely not, yeah? If you were to find that someone voted from France or China, yep. would you exclude their votes? I, I wouldn't. So one of the other things is I don't make these decisions. The, the mayor's office or whoever creates the wiki survey makes that decision. Not me. Uh, so, so you just give them the data set and they do the analysis, or do you give them the analysis results? So all the stuff that's on the website, we do automatically and make available to everyone. Right. You can also download CSV files, um, very detailed CSV files, which you can do whatever kind of analysis that you want. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the CSV files because that's what we actually use. So I would say our data export capabilities are very, very developed relative to the rest of the site. Um, and we can try to generalize this to other types of wiki surveys. Um, for example, uh, where the question, there are multiple questions, or the question itself might change over time. Um, we're thinking about ways to actually embed these in an interesting way within a regular survey. There's a lot of possibilities to generalize this. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned covariance, does that mean that you have some standard demographic, let's say, items that you would ask that would be more of a conventional survey type of thing? We don't have that now. Um, one could do that. Um, but that's what you meant by how you would add covariance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could, yeah, you could collect that information or you could use, work with groups that already have that information. Mm -hmm. So for example, well, like the ASA, they know a lot about all the members. You could send each member a unique URL. And then from that, you could link back their votes to the data that the ASA already has. Of course, you'd have to make it clear that you're going to do the anonymous linking of the data. Um, but that's a way to get the covariates without asking people. So I think in general, we ask people for these covariates a lot. But it, like that information is already recorded in so many places. It seems very wasteful to ask people all those things over and over. Um, yeah? So it seems like, you know, I was trying to think of, you know, when we want to have a goal aggregating information in one place is in focus and generating ideas, mm -hmm. one place is in focus groups. Mm -hmm. It seems sort of like a nice online focus group with a very with a much more systematic way of compiling the results, which is one place where focus group methodology is totally, you know, informed. Yeah. Um, and and so that seems like you know I mean you can imagine using this for a lot of you know message testing or 
um, any 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 place where you had both preference, you know, objects that you wanted to scale in some sense, but also where you wanted to make sure that you know you got put other objects into the pool for scaling mm -hmm. that you had anticipated and aggregate them. So have mm -hmm. there been applications like a, the political campaigns? Yeah, well, one person. Yeah, so one person who was uh, running. Are there, are there any results about death animals or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I was so, thinking about the true versus false. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our users was uh, someone who was running for Congress in our district. Um, and he uh, used it to try to get ideas uh, mainly from his supporters. So he sent it out through Facebook and Twitter through the people who had already sort of made a connection to him. So it's been used in that way. It hasn't been used in a more systematic focus group kind of way yet. Um, but it, it has yeah. I was going to say, yeah, uh, governments, not just not necessarily politicians, people running for office, but governments have been sort of the main users so far, which is something I didn't really expect. Um, our first users were actually the Princeton student government. This project was developed um, with the student government president at the time. His name was Josh Weinstein. And um, in general, I think it matches nicely with the goals that a lot of governments have. They say they want to be open to what people say. They want to be transparent. They want to be democratic. And this is a way that they can do that that's relatively easy. I mean, they just create the website. The website does all the work for them. So, hmm? I was just thinking about the further application. I don't know if you uh, looked into it, which would be a way to generate a website that would be inclusive of other people's surveys and quizzes. So what I had in mind was, you know, all these dating sites. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, like I've been on OkCupid. Yeah. One of the things they do is they let people generate quizzes, and then you get all these questions of like, yeah. what. 80s movies character would you be? Mm -hmm. And like some of these pleases, you know, don't say much about the person, but some are actually very good. Yeah. So if only they had taken that quiz and, and included that in the matrix that matches mm -hmm. people. So is that, and it's kind of like, you know, Facebook, everybody creates their own application. Mm -hmm. If you could like tap into that, and that I think would allow for even a greater variety of, of you know, queuing and probing and framing mm -hmm. because there is still something very limiting in about, you know, you can only pose a question or sure. So yeah, so in some ways we do have this sort of user generated content in the sense that the surveys, anyone can create a survey for whatever reason they want and within the surveys anyone can upload any kind of thing they want. There's no matching really across surveys or mixing across surveys. That's actually one structure in the data that we're not taking good advantage of because so we have now you know, 1,500 of these wiki surveys. So we should be able to potentially use patterns from some of, like for example, if we want to estimate how many more votes are going to occur in this wiki survey before people stop coming. So most of the voting has a structure where you, it like peaks and then falls off. And so given what we see at this point, we should be able to look across the database and then make an estimate about how much more voting we're going to see, and then that might affect, for example, how, how, how aggressively we would go to showing the new ideas. There's a lot of stuff that we're not really using across these uh, databases, or for example, the ideas that people leave on. So although the preferences of people in New York City might be differences that different than the preferences of people in other areas, we could potentially use information about when people leave from across these surveys. I'm thinking for organizations as well, like New York City is so big, it, uh, such a structure would have allowed it to create its own website, but then to still be for uh, neighborhoods, for yep. instance, to create their own stuff. Sure, they could do that. Okay. Um, so this, was that 530? Yeah, 530. Okay, so I want to um, talk a little bit more then about some more general issues. So hopefully this will be kind of a virtuous cycle so that users will lead to research, research will lead to a better website, a better website will lead to more users and more research and so on. So this can become a sort of self-sustaining system once the startup costs are overcome. 
Um, and we've taken a number of steps to design this system to be scalable so that we can sort of tap into this virtuous cycle. So one thing is the sign up process is very easy. It takes about a minute. It's about as hard as creating a Gmail account. Um, the system can spread through pre-existing groups. So for example, if uh, the, as I said, the Princeton student government used it and they emailed 5,000 students, if even a tiny percentage of those students are in a different group and then they want to use it in their other group, then they'll send it to hundreds of people in that group if a small percentage of them pick it up. So because it can, sort, even if the pickup rate is very, very low, if there's enough large groups, it can spread that way. Um, we're hosted in the cloud, so it makes it very easy for us to scale up and scale down our server capacity. Um, also, the pages are designed to be translatable, so we've already been translated by volunteers into these languages. Um, and if anyone wants to translate it into another language, let me know. And we'll, we'll get that onto the site. Uh, also, the whole thing is open, so it's open source. The API that we use, this is like the programming toolkit you can use to build your own site. Uh, and you can also download all of your own data. Um, and so this sort of scalability is really important in terms of thinking now about how this relates to what I think internet and sort of digital era research is going to be like in comparison to the research that we're currently doing. So I'm, I'm actually working on a book about this now. Um, tentatively titled uh, Studying Society in a Digital World. And so one of the themes of this, <coughs> what I think is different, is that the, the cost structure of the data is different. So if you were doing a telephone survey and you wanted to double the number of respondents, it would cost approximately twice as much. And if you wanted to increase your sample size by 100, it would cost roughly 100 times as much. Um, with the web data, that's totally different. So we want to have 100 times as many people use the site. That basically costs no additional money. So with the web, there's big fixed costs to get everything up and running, but then there's basically no variable cost. Whereas with a lot of other methods, the fixed costs are lower, but the variable costs are higher. So you can think of this also with ethnography. If you want to spend twice as much time in the field, it takes twice as much time. If you want to do historical work and you want to read 50 times as many documents, it takes 50 times as much time, or lab experiments, all these things. But with this digital data, the scaling is different. And so we are able to sort of tap into a new sort of range where we have much more data than we used to. So it's, in some ways, we can reach a zone where it wouldn't have been possible for us. So for example, in uh, one thing I did earlier, we did a, a web-based experiment that had 27,000 people. So that's like about 100 times bigger than a standard lab experiment. And if you have 100 times as many people, it's not like you do what you were doing before, just scaled up by 100. You can actually do qualitatively different things. So in this case, we used a different experimental design that people hadn't really thought about because they just never had the chance to have 27,000 people before. And so I think having access to this large amounts of data will require asking and answering questions in different ways. Um, also, this sort of web-based or digital research enables methods with no obvious offline equivalents. So a lot of what we see now on the web, I would argue is sort of translational research. So um, like web-based surveys are basically paper surveys put onto the web. That gives you some advantages in terms of speed and cost, but it's pretty similar to what you were doing before. Or you see people doing experiments on Mechanical Turk. That gives you some reduced cost and increased speed, but it's basically the same as laboratory experiments that people were doing before. But like with these wiki surveys, there's stuff that doesn't have an obvious offline equivalent. Um, and that's what I think is going to be the most interesting stuff. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what that stuff will be right now. Um, but I think, like you know, people thought of the the car as the horseless carriage, supposedly. Um, and I think a lot of the way we think about this data now is is very structured by the ways that we've thought about data in the past. And there's just new stuff that's out there that we'll find uh, eventually. Uh, and then the last point <clears throat> is about. Uh, what I would call found data versus design data. So 
a lot of the data that people are using now from the web <clears throat> is what I would call found data, or data where the people had, the researcher played no role in sort of the design and collection of the data. So for example, if I would go out and scrape Twitter, that would be found data. Because I didn't play a role, I don't have any control over the data generating process in Twitter. Um, and that contrasts with a lot of the data that we as social scientists normally analyze, where we spend a lot of time thinking about what data should be collected. And we try to, des I mean, there's a, we, we spend a lot of time on research design because we think that having the right data is potentially much better than having lots of the wrong data. Um, and so I think the tension between found data and design data also comes up in how we do our work. So in this project, we built this entire website, which was a huge pain, uh, huge. Um, but we did that because that allowed us to get exactly the data that we want. So this website was designed exactly for this purpose. If we had tried to scrape, scrape Twitter or Facebook or do something, work with some other company, we would end up not getting the data that we want. Um, so I think there's gonna be a lot more of like building stuff so that you get exactly the data that you want. Um, and interesting stuff about how we can combine found and design data to sort of maximize the usefulness of both of them. Um, so lastly, so I'm standing up here talking to you and Karen and I worked on this paper, but there's a large number of people who are responsible for the site. So this first group of people is a set of web developers who have worked on the project on and off over uh, the last two years. And these are undergraduate and graduate students who have worked on the project as well. So this is the research group that's really responsible for this, and um, you can learn more about the site um, at, at our blog as well. So thank you.